Welcome to School of the Bible. School of the Bible, we like to take a book of the Bible and we take 15 minutes, set <laughs> clock over there, to uh, look at the Word of God to spend 15 verses read and then allow for God to speak to us in a way that applies that 15 verses to us personally, individually, and corporately. Now, how that happens is for him to do, not for me to organize or categorize or subjective, subjectively apply some kind of study methodology to expound upon my commentary of the scriptures because that's really not what exegetical study is it's just something that man does that's no big deal it just happens to be a means with which man preaches and so we allow for the Holy Spirit to cause you to hear what he would say in these scriptures that are being applied we call it Judges 1515 because it's 15 verses in 15 minutes we call it the School of the Bible because, in reality, we will always be studying the Bible, so to speak, or living it out as a revelation of Jesus to us by way of the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus, being that He is, from the beginning to the end, the volume of it written thereof is about Him, not you. Not me, not the children of Israel, not some kind of prophecy, but just Jesus. So you got to get a handle on that because sometimes people get too clinical in their studies or too Greco, Greco or too Jewish or too whatever, rather than allowing God to speak to us. And so in integral specificity, we like to say that the integer of the specifics that are here in the scriptures are such as they are, the way they are, as they are. Some people say the Bible is literal, some people say inerrant, and I just simply say that, hey, the Spirit of God makes what we read inerrant or errant on purpose by design. So in reality, leaving it in his hands, we read, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for against us, against the Canaanites first, to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me unto my lot. Then we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go forth with thee unto thy lot. So Simeon went with them. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek ten thousand men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings have their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done. So God hath required me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem, and had taken it, and smitten it with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwell in the mountain, and in the south, and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwell in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. And they slew Shishai, and Ahiman, and Talmai. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir, Debir, and the name of Debir was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it to him, will I give Asha, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Asha, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass, when she came to him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ask, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Always, whenever you get into the study of scriptures, you find that there are people that will apply either their own understanding 
or sometimes be inspired by the written word to some kind of understanding. Oftentimes we either don't apply or do apply the reality of what is being said here to what God is doing. In our modern day, I like the idea that today as I am reading this, today as I am hearing what God is doing in the book of Judges, chapters 1 through 15, God is speaking directly to certain prayers that are being asked of him, and he's giving specific directions. That's not like what has happened in the country today in America with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has gone ahead and done things without thinking, he's done things without praying, and he's done things without asking professional opinions. And as such, the judges have said no. They have proven and demonstrated in the court of law that some of the things that he's doing are not legal. They are not what God has said, they are not what God has told them to do, and they have nothing to do with the law of the land or the Constitution of the United States or anything that would be considered civil in our treatment of refugees or those who are coming into the country. And as such, it is reminding me that judges God has brought into the land at this time because the leadership had gotten so failing that there was no longer a great leader to lead the children of Israel. But he's going to set up judges over the children of Israel. There are going to come men that are going to have to make decisions about what God has said, and God is either going to speak to them and tell them what to do, or he's going to speak to them and they're going to do what they want anyways. And we're going to see that throughout the book of Judges because we see that in America today. We see the failure of leadership, the weakness of people who have claimed to be leaders that don't have the guts to stand up and admit that they are wrong. Donald Trump has failed miserably in doing anything that God has asked him to do. He is not a Christian. He doesn't choose to follow Christianity, and he doesn't want to be a part of the Christian faith, and God will judge him. Just like here, we see that God has judged the nations as this man, this king, Adonai Bezek, had done so much evil to others as a Canaanite king that he had cut off their thumbs and cut off their toes. And that causes you to be at imbalance. There's certain things you cannot do when your thumbs are gone and your toes are gone. You can't walk straight. You can't talk straight, so to speak. You uh, can't handle food because you, you're missing your thumbs. Now, obviously, today in modern society, we've seen that there is the availability of doing things with handicapped people. And I myself am a person that's handicapped, though you can't see it. I have a bag on my side and, you know, I have to deal with a lot of other issues about my health. But in those days, that would be a great disadvantage because they lived outside and they lived constantly in a work-related orientation where you had to have the availability of your hands and your feet. Now... I kind of interestingly find that kind of curious about the children of Israel doing that, whether they should have done it to him or they were trying to make just scales or whether or not God had told them to wipe them out. It's interesting to me that we find here that the Canaanites had Jerusalem and Judah burns it to the ground. It is interesting that we're going to see another time when Israel has the land and Jerusalem is burned to the ground. Even as we're going to see that in the near future, we're going to see again Jerusalem becoming a focal point and that the Antichrist is going to come and then everyone's going to flee Jerusalem because sudden destruction is going to come upon Jerusalem. Now some people think that the temple is going to stand, the third temple is going to be there until it goes into the great tribulation period or the great, uh, the millennial kingdom it doesn't say it only says that the oblation would cease it doesn't say that israel is protected of the land or that you know there's going to be a temple in some people say there'll be a temple in the millennial and there probably will be as it's described in the book of ezekiel ezekiel's temple but the important part here that i see for us reading isn't just about donald trump you know because that's nice you know i'm glad that he's you know whatever he's doing but he's a man that's going to fail and miserably be brought down even as adonai bezek was brought down and his toes were removed and his fingers you know and donald trump has his fingers in a lot of business things so let that be as the spirit leads you let you let that guide you to whatever you think that means but 
we find what most people focus in on is Caleb and his daughter. You know, it's interesting that the daughter is still intermarrying, is that this isn't kind of like a long distance cousin or something. This is a, almost like a close family member. The brother is the one, you know, of the son of the brother, you know, and it's kind of like, mm, okay. You know, they're intermarrying, you know, still a little bit. You know, this is why we have a genealogical indicator, a marker that is passed down from generation to generation. But what's also interesting is that Caleb's not a Jew. Caleb is someone who fought with the children of Israel. Caleb is someone that was given an inheritance with the children of Israel. Oftentimes, people make the mistake of thinking that they can make an exclusion of we Christians versus them and that God doesn't use other people. Kind of like what's happening with Muslims today. People say, well, Muslims aren't Americans. And I say, really? Since when? Muslims have been Americans for centuries. You know, I want to say centuries, you know, but for hundreds of years because we've only been around a couple hundred years. But the choice of faith is not what determines someone being an American in this land because of the freedom of religion. And that's the same thing that was true even in the Old Testament at this time. We see Caleb fighting with the children of Israel and getting an inheritance because he was Joshua's right-hand man. He was someone who fought at the older age of being strong in the Lord and powerful, and God had anointed him even though he wasn't a Jew. Remember that. Because oftentimes we get that wrong perspective about who is God going to use. Will he use a man that's not a Christian? Yes, at times. Will he use a man who chooses to become a Christian? Yes, he will. Does he choose to use you? Of course he does. But he doesn't leave himself excluded to only using you or me. God will move by his Holy Spirit outside the church if he can't use those that are in the church. And if he can't find a bride, he will go out and compel those off the street, living on the street, to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb and ask them, even as it says in the parable, where's your righteous clothes for the marriage of the supper has come? So, I'm, well, I don't know, you know, I don't have it, and they'll throw them out. Doesn't seem fair. But you see, this isn't a book, Judges, of fairness. This is a book of governance. This is what God is trying to show us about how he governs. If you'll notice, it says, After the death of Joshua came to pass, that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first? Now, it was already said what was going to happen previously in other books about how God was leading the order and Joshua determined it. Well, now the children of Israel are going, hey, you know what? We need another opinion. Let's ask God again. And God answers. Interesting, isn't it? And he gives the same answer. But this time he's being specific. He says to Judah, look, you go. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And notice the very next step which is very interesting to me because is this God or is this man? And that's what you have to determine because that's what I see all the way through this. We see a lot of things being done, but is it God or is it man? And that's what I think you should look at every time you go through the book of Judges. Ask yourself, is it God or is it man? Because here's what it says. The Lord said, Judah will go up and behold, I have delivered the land into his hand, into Judah's hand. Now, Judah says unto Simeon, his brother, Hey, come on up with us unto my lot, and we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go down with you into thy lot. So Simeon went with them. Did they pray about it? Did they ask God about it? Did they do what the children of Israel said? Hey, who's supposed to go? Judah will. I've delivered it into Judah and Simeon's hand. Not. You see, the compromise that Joshua made had failed in his asking of the Lord what to do. And we read in the book of Joshua the same thing happening. Joshua forgot to pray and ask God about it, and then he gets stuck with the people that are not part of the children of Israel, that do live in the land. Remember that too, because Joshua made a treaty with those that were living in the land, and God had said not to, but they did anyways. And today it's the same way. Israel has people that aren't Jewish that live in the land, and it's their legal right to God also. Read it in Joshua. You'll find it there. Now we see in Judges another chance where here we go. Judah's told, hey, don't worry. I got you covered. God's going to be your strength, your tower, your provision. So what do they do? They go out and get guns. Simeon. 
They go out and get support, Simeon. They go out and get more than what God told them to do, Simeon. Do you need guns today? Do you need more than what God has provided you? Do you need someone else to help you? Do you need what God has not told you to do to be what God has told you to do? In other words, why, if God is God, would you ask for anything else? Well, God told me to go, you know, to, you know, Tanzania. Now I need to go raise money for it. Really? Did you turn around and ask God for it? No, of course not. It's the Christian thing to do. We raise money after God tells us something to do. Well, I, I think God told me. I had this impression. I had this job offer. You know, and I, I, that must be God. You know, it must be my job. You know, my job says to move to Idaho, so I'm going to start a Calvary Chapel in Idaho because I got a job there to do it. Really? Now, I'm not knocking Idaho because I don't know Calvary Chapel, Idaho. I, you know, <laughs> let me think. Who do I know in Idaho that's Calvary Chapel? Uh, Boise, you know, well, that's not the way they work. But a lot of Calvary Chapels work that way. The pastor thinks that because he's got a job somewhere, oh, well, the Lord must be blessing me, so I'm going to be a pastor there because I got a job there. Is that how God works? Not according to judges. You go out. You go out, you do. So the issue of compromise is what we need to watch out for all the way through judges. We see compromise in ourselves, we see compromise in our president, we see compromise in our society, we see compromise in politics. Politics has always been about compromise. It has never been about the truth, it has never been about facts, it is always the compromise of making an agreement between two different opinions and then compromising to get what you want. And now we have a president who's unwilling to compromise. He just says, I want what I want when I want it. We're going to see that in Judges. The same is true. So, as we go through this, remember those two things. What God has said, what man has said, and the compromise between the two. Because Judges will teach you that you can't compromise or you will get the fruit of your compromise. When Christians compromised and decided to elect Donald Trump, they got the fruit of it. And unfortunately, they're going to reap the sadness of it because the reality is you have a person who doesn't care what you have to say he doesn't care what you do he's going to try to shove through what he wants of his own personal agenda and until people stand up and say this is what God said as we'll see judges happens throughout the time of the children of Israel moving into the land judges will stand up and say no even as they did to Donald Trump when his ban he wanted to reinstate they said no Bluntly. And it didn't take them very long. So what will you do? When God speaks to you and God has something for you to do, are you going to stand up and argue about it? Are you going to go out and figure it out? Are you going to compromise? Are you going to lie about it? Are you going to cheat, steal, manipulate, maneuver, kind of get your Christian thing together? It's like, hey, you know, we got to do this because this is the way Christians do it. Or are you going to ask God what to do? Because that's what you need to do. That is, if you're reading the book of Judges.